I will be introducing our guest today. Uh, today, speaking is my good friend, Eric Hawkinson. Uh, Eric and I have been friends for about three years. Uh, we're both in a research group together. We research about uh, technology in education using VR, virtual reality, augmented reality, AR, very high tech stuff. Uh, let's see, I'll read some of Eric's titles. Eric is the Associate Professor of Learning and Design and Technology and founding faculty member of the School of Global Tourism at Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. Kyoto Gaikoku Daikoku. Uh, he's also the coordinator of the study group London Mixed Augmented Virtual Reality Special Interest Group with Dave Charles. Okay. All right, let's welcome Eric. Everybody, round of applause. Hello. Hello. Good to see you all. It's great to be here. It's my first time to visit this university. It's very, it seems like a very nice spacious campus, very, a little bit different than the one I teach at down in Kyoto. Um, thanks for the invitation and thanks for the introduction. Uh, Josh and I are friends, as he mentioned before, so I'm also happy to come and see him in his work environment. So if you see me afterwards or even after walking around, you can come and tell me if he's a good teacher or not. Give me, give me some good rumors or whatever, right? He's <laughs> like, no, don't do that. Uh, but I came to talk about something that uh, Josh and I do together in our research, and that's around these new technologies, immersive technologies, around mostly education, but I want to talk to you about the future today, and that is around what these technologies are doing to the future of work, the future of recruiting, and the future of the kind of the skills and things and knowledge that we might need moving into the future. There's one key word related to that, and that's automation. Automation. Has anyone ever heard that term automation before? You raise your hand. Automation. Have you ever heard that term before? A couple of people in front. Right? It's kind of a broad term, so my goal today was to kind of give us a little bit of deeper understanding of the term automation and what we can expect coming from automation through technology in the next five, 10, 15, maybe even 30 years into the future. <clears throat> That's just a little bit about me. Josh was kind enough to introduce some of the things. I'm a founding member. We started a new School of Global Tourism down in Kyoto two years ago. I helped found that. Before that, I was living in upstate Kyoto in Fukushima, Fukushima for about 10, 15 years in between there. Um, coordinate research with Josh, and I also founded a, a company that does AR, augmented reality, which I'll introduce today. And I'm a big proponent of TED. Has anybody ever watched a TED video? TED, right? Great, a lot of people. So that, as a, if you're studying English or any language, I completely recommend that as a tool for learning because you can pick up, get 15 minutes from an expert on any kind of field that you might be interested in. And the website is great about transcripts and translating into 40, 50, sometimes 60 different languages. So um, I help organize TEDx Kyoto. And TEDx is like a, a local version of it. TEDx Kyoto is the largest local event in Japan. And we have it just about every year at the uh, Kyoto Kokusai Kaikan in the northern part of Kyoto. So if you're interested in TED Talks, uh, we'll have our next event next May. We should have about a thousand people show up and about um, 12 speakers and, and performers. It's usually a great event to come if you want to get the feel of TED in person. That's me in a nutshell. So, today, um, to talk about automation, it's a broad concept. There's all these technologies that are contributing to this concept of automation. And we kind of mix them up, jumble them up, and then all, a lot of people, especially in commercial spaces, people looking to move the frontier ahead and do marketing at the same time, usually do a disservice by telling us new, exciting vocabularies that go along with automation, either to scare us into buying something or to promote something in turn. So we'll talk a little bit about 
like what's happening in automation in three stages, right? The first one's already happening. Most of it, you can feel the effects right now. So we're going to try and relate that is the first step of the automation process. Things getting basically more efficient uh, due to the use of computers and automating processes with mobile phones and things like that that we have now. Then we'll start to get partners with our computers. We'll start to be a team with our computers. We'll start to train our computers. They'll start to train us and we'll be more deeply in integrated with automated systems in the next phase. And that's the kind of the stuff that both Josh and I are doing research on in the, in the education space. And then looking way ahead to the future is the robots. A lot of people, when they think of automation, especially of artificial intelligence, they think of a robot walking around. They think of like maybe a robot in a, like a Siri that talks to you and kind of feels your emotions. That stuff's kind of still far away. So that would be after these few different things. And to understand what happens in that kind of sci-fi robot automated world, we kind of have to understand the steps that we're going to to get there. And that's why we're going to talk about these first steps, especially the one that's happening right now to us. All right, so let's start off with algorithms. Algorithms, they're everywhere. Everybody has a smartphone, right? Everybody has one of these? There's no Garake type in here? No? <laughs> There's usually one or two of us wherever I go. Um, we're in the mobile era of, te of technology, and algorithms are deciding or helping us more and more in everyday life. If you use social media, you can, this is probably obvious to you because Facebook and Instagram and Google, when you do a search, is using algorithms to show you things that it thinks you like. So every time you click Ine or every time you do a search in Google to find out some information that's saved somewhere, every time you click on something, every time you do something, it's saved somewhere, and that information has been reflected back to you sometime in the future. So like you do five searches on some kind of fashion brand in Google, you're more likely to get to see those things into the future. So those are just some algorithms for your everyday life and social media, but algorithms are being used everywhere to automate processes, sometimes in scary ways. Um, another example is in the criminal justice system in, in America. I don't know in Japan if this is something that's being used, but an algorithm, you'll stick in a bunch of data about somebody that committed a crime into an algorithm, and they will spit out through this math process, will predict whether you're likely to commit a crime again in the future. And a judge and a jury might see this information from an algorithm and therefore can inform whether or not you go to jail or not. And some people don't really realize that it, this, a lot of these everyday processes in criminal justice and our, we're getting into these smart cities where we're leaving up our thought processes to algorithms and we're building on them as we go forward. To help kind of make that more clear, I'm going to talk about something called the gig economy. The gig economy. And these, these algorithms that's happening right now is allowing this, is probably the biggest driving force in this new style of employment that we're seeing. Has anybody ever heard of the gig economy? Gig economy? How about the word gig? Right? A, gig is, a gig is a short time, usually for musicians, they use the word gig, right? I got a gig tonight, right? It means you're gonna go play at a place, right? It's just a one-time thing. So a gig is, is also a term for short time work or temporary work. And gig work is increasing. And one of the biggest reasons it is increasing is because we have these algorithms, these processings online, usually, that you can put all of your skills, all of your knowledge, all of your experience, and that can be automatically given to companies or somebody that needs your particular skill or your experience in some project. And that allows you to move around, become sort of a 
digital nomad is the term that's often used. So people uh, will just work, it's short time work, they have these skills, they have these knowledge. For example, uh, translators, there's a lot of work going on right now, it's just a gig translator. So it's getting harder and harder because of this, these algorithms are getting so efficient at getting and finding the skills that you need in new employees. Companies are less incentivized to hire someone, train them, and after you train them, you want usually you've invested in that worker, so you want them to stay and get your return on your investment on that employee. But these algorithms, these systems, can just judge based on past experience and all this data that can be collected about you and the stuff you put about yourself online, and it's allowing us to commoditize our labor, commoditize our labor, meaning making our labor like something on the market like selling gold or wheat or corn, right? They can be traded and bought and sold. So a couple of examples, Airbnb versus a regular hotel. Has anybody stayed in an Airbnb? A couple people? You have to tell me, I've never stayed in one. <laughs> Josh said he has. Uber versus taxi, Fiverr versus Upwork. Has anybody ever seen those companies' names before? No? Talk about that in just a second. So, Think about Airbnb versus a hotel. So this is a great example of algorithms and how they're affecting long, full-time established work, right? Airbnb is a website. You can put up your free room. Um, if you have an extra apartment somewhere, you can put it online. And people, when they travel, can go and stay at your extra room. You can put up, so this is commoditized, this is democratized ability to stay in places. And people are doing that by themselves. So the workforce, the, the possible workforce for that just went up, went through the roof. Like there's more, more people on Airbnb willing and able to give you a room than ever before that could be offered from hotels, all the hotels in the world, or in Japan in particular. But that comes with its own set of challenges as well, right? So now if you have an Airbnb, you have all that managing process that happens at a hotel, usually a company, things like insurance, and you need somebody to design um, a poster or advertisement for you. You're doing that by yourself. You don't have all these um, employees working for you like in a hotel. So then they are people running Airbnb, going through the algorithms, then feed back into the algorithms and this type of work by hiring short-time workers themselves. So short-time workers, part-time workers, hire other part-time workers and collaborate together. And because we have these systems in place, more of it's happening and it's building on each other. It's kind of like a sumikasane thing that says, uh, building upon each other. Uber and taxi is the same thing happening again, right? Uber's democratizing the taxi business, right? Instead of one or two, two or three taxi companies, you can go to work yourself, go into an algorithm, and the Uber app will put you online, connect you with your GPS coordinates to a phone to somebody else, and then get your fare, or at least a part of your fare, by using your own car and your own time. Okay. Fiber and Upwork, these guys over here, the two most popular websites online right now for part-time skilled work. And moving towards the future, if you want to get to dip your toe, if you want to practice, you want to get to know what this kind of temporary work is like, I encourage you to go on these websites and just check it out. And if you have a skill, for example, maybe you're a graphic designer or you can make music, you could even dip your toe into doing some freelance work through these sites. Because in the future, this is kind of going to be a skill that's going to be more necessary. To be able to market yourself, to be able to find your own customers, and to be able to communicate directly and get your own short-time work. Get yourself hired in a way. Right, just a couple of statistics on that. Just in America, they think most of us will be freelancing in the future. Right? Full-time workers are going down, down, down. This is happening all over the world. 
little bit less in Japan, but it's coming for us too in this country. And there's more short-time freelance work going up. It's good in, in one way, you have more flexibility, you can move jobs, you can maybe work from where you want to work, but it's more difficult because those jobs, you have to kind of arrange your own insurance, you have to get your own, there's a, there's a whole list of support services that usually go along with a company, large company that employs you full time. You kind of have to take care of that yourself when you're in this um, gig economy. Right? So that's step one, these algorithms. All these processes are being automated. And step two is the augmentation. So that's happening now, all the algorithms, the freelance work. It's changing the, the, the way we work and how we find work. But now we're going to get into the AI stuff that's coming down the road. Like we're going to be partnering with computers more, partnering with algorithms. They're going to get more, a little more complex. They're going to be able to do more repetitive, a little bit more complex work for us. And we're going to be working with them. To kind of understand that, um, talk about the medium of augmented reality. Augmented reality. Anybody ever use augmented reality? They want to play Pokemon Go? Pokemon Go, get to play Masuka, miss a couple people. It's a version of augmented reality, right? So you're more integrated with this, a virtual world. Just think about that. You're, you're, you're in a physical place, and the app allows a physical creature to be in that physical place with you. And you're training Pokemon Go because it knows where you're walking. It knows what kind of Pokemon you like. And so that algorithms before, but we just know the skills that we have, we listen online. Now we're getting feeding more data into this, these algorithms. And so they're able to give us more robust help when we look for work and, and uh, a job. So when you think about how that works, each time along the process we get more involved in the way we share and receive data. Right, so you have a resume that has just some words on it, and that could be analyzed. But later on, we make a profile on LinkedIn or something like that. You put a picture of yourself, maybe some video. Then you add some audio, and we have all that in our pockets now, right? There it is, in my, one in my pockets. <laughs> so all that writing, all that, all those videos, all that audio is now in our pocket. Right. Now for the automation process, that's important because now we have everything we need while in our pockets at all times. So if you're a freelancer in that, in that world, you have 24-7 access to other freelancers and they have 24 access to you. What augmented reality is going to do is take our, this data that's in our pocket, take it back out and connect it to the world around us. So uh, a location, like in the Pokemon Go example, has a Pokemon connected to it. That's the digital contents connected to the world. But now we can start connecting names to people's faces with facial recognition. We can start connecting um, instructions to health data that we see. Anybody wearing a Fitbit? Fitbit to help track your health, right? Now, if it's tracking your health, you might get data about, oh, you need to, you should go see a doctor or something right away. So you're giving more data, feeding them into these algorithms, and we're getting more <coughs> curated information in return. It's like a bridge, if you want to think about it. Augmented reality is a bridge between the digital world and the real world. And that, that bridge is going to get more deeper and more complex as we move towards the future. So all these words that are Contributing to automation, so these are just some kind of icons to represent them, right? So we have AI, IoT, which is the Internet of Things. So that means just an internet-connected device. So right now, your maybe your microwave, or your toothbrush, or anything is now connected via Wi-Fi to the internet. So that's collecting data about you too. So like a smart toothbrush will know if you didn't brush your teeth for the full five minutes or more. So all that stuff gets curated, and then gets fed into these algorithms. And now machines will know if we maybe we're a little bit less healthy one month, or maybe we're working two months the next month, or we have a skill that we didn't know we had 
right? Maybe we're good at a certain kind of conversation, or maybe we're good in large groups. This augmented reality is going to feed into those. And so the computer will be able to tell us, hey, you're applying for these freelance jobs for music, but we notice that you're having a lot of time talking to these people in this maybe this particular country, and I think maybe there's a couple other jobs that you might be interested in. So all these, these algorithms will get smarter in helping us find work. And so there's a whole spectrum of these realities. We'll be going inside virtual reality. This will maybe cut down on our travel, right? We'll go into a virtual world and do communication. We'll have a meeting inside of a virtual world, or we'll bring contents to us in an augmented world. It's, a big it's like a rainbow of realities. <laughs> Anyone ever played this one? This is a game. <laughs> So this is me in my office up, up down in Kyoto. This is a game called Beat Saber. A couple of things happening here. Um, I'm, I'm working out, basically. I'm having fun at the same time, right? And so, and I have a camera in my office and a virtual camera inside this world. So this is me and it's projecting lightsabers on top of my hands as I move. So this, this is something called mixed reality. So it's a blending of these technologies put together. And this game knows how fast I'm moving. If it, if so to, if you wanted to judge my health, just playing a game like this would be a good judge. Like maybe on Wednesday, I was a bit tired and I wasn't able to hit the blocks as fast as I was before. Um, so that's a good representation of the data that's being collected us more and more using this technology as we move towards the future. There's another example. This is me. I don't know if you, a lot of you can see that one. I'm just waving my hands in nowhere <laughs> in the virtual world. I'm looking, this is my view from what I see through my eyes. This is something called a tesseract. A tesseract. It's, um, it's the shadow of a four-dimensional object in three-dimensional three space. And I put a light inside of the three dimensions so I can see the shadow of the tesseract on a 2D floor. So it's like trying, trying to experiment in ways and communicating uh, things that are hard to visualize, right? So this is going to help us in fields like engineering, science, uh, bioengineering, so we can actually go inside of a, a molecule and talk about things. And as we do that, it's going to feed again into the algorithms. Now that's the virtual world and thinking about augmented reality. Um, this is a project that I helped do with Josh. Um, with our research, I'm connecting digital contents to a set of playing cards, right? So we're gonna get to this place called, uh, I call it the phone on the face, or phone on the face. Everyone has their phone, they pull it out, you can Google things, it's like a magic box, right? But we're gonna get to this time very soon to where we have something, a heads up display or something like that, it has a camera in it perhaps. And so we can get just-in-time information, what we're looking at, before we even ask for it. So all these algorithms are going to start forcing their way into our consciousness, right? Before you have to, oh, what's this? You're out walking in the forest, you see a flower, oh, what's that flower? You Google it, maybe take a picture of it. But now, if you have something on your face, if you look at it, and it might just pop up, like right? this is the flower you're looking at. We're giving up a lot of our brain processes to our devices. Um, who, who can, who can remember uh, the, your parents' phone number? <laughs> Maybe a lot of you. Oh, that's quite a lot. I have trouble remembering phone numbers, <laughs> even more so that I got a smartphone because it connects all my phone numbers into my phone and it transfers every time I get a new phone. So we're giving up that memorization process to our phones. That, that might happen even worse in the future if I have class and put your name above your head, right? I might not remember who you are, but I'll have this device to help me um, recall who you are. That'll get really insane, insane in the future. You might just walk down the aisle and you pick up things, and whether you have a lot of advertisements connected to it or not, um, everything's going to get augmented. So this is like some dystopian future where 
the, the digital contents and the real world are blending so hard and fast, like people you've walked by, you get an ad, like what you do on the internet, right? And if it glitches out, then you just, you, it's like losing a part of your brain, right? Okay, so we're, we have algorithms that are already on the internet helping us find part-time work, and then we move into augmented virtual reality where we suck up more information about us to project that back into us. And then we've got to move into the future with robots in there. Are we, are we on time? Yeah, 15 minutes. Another 15? Great. Yeah. So this is when robots are starting to learn basic human uh, functions, right? Uh, we have already robots working in factories, right, that put cars together for us, but they're doing a repetitive set of tasks. Like a car comes in, robot knows where to put the chair, the robot knows how to make a screw here, a screw there. That's repetitive, consistent work. And so that's, that's really important when you think about your own future of work. You don't want to go for a career that has repetitive, consistent work because that can be automated much more easily. But what anything that this is telling us is that creative work, things that are related to humans, like maybe artistic endeavors or educational endeavors or humanitarian efforts are going to be probably more important moving towards the future if we're thinking about automation because it's less easy, it's harder to replicate by machines. So in the, just before this in this era, we have the virtual reality. Right? And this is going to help this stage because these robots need to be trained. And so when we walk in the kitchen with our glasses, our phone on our face, and we make cereal, they're actually going to be soaking up all that data and teaching a robot how to make cereal. And so sometime in the future when we have robotics that are cheap enough, they can go into your home. Maybe your home's already been scanned because you've been walking inside your home collecting all this data with your phone on your face, and then a robot can come in and help you be like a caregiver or um, an assistant or anything that we might want to auto automate as a repetitive task. A lot of this is great. So things like mining, like a, being a coal miner, dangerous work it might be automated. It's things that humans probably shouldn't do anyway. But things robots will also be doing things like writing poetry, making music perhaps, because we have lots of data out there of people making music, and we can stick that into an algorithm and train and train and train to make music as well. So, to help us think about that world, I wanted to kind of represent an idea to help you conceptualize what you might want to think about when you think about what you should be doing as far as work into, into the future. And that's this idea of the experience economy. Every, every part of the way we have these economies that are kind of built on each other, and we think about the experience economy, that's where this is all starting to happen, we're all starting to move towards, and it's the le least likely, these type of jobs, least likely to be automated away. So what do I mean by that? Hmm. Right, so we have two vertices on here. One is the complexity and one is the price, right? So here's the price, and here's the complexity of it, the customizability of it, right? So way down in here in this corner, it's super cheap and super simple. Way up in this corner, it's getting more expensive and more complex, which is important because the more complex it is, the like, harder it is to automate. Right, so we have commodities, goods, services, and then experiences that come down to these four steps in the experience economy. And the further along down the road you are in this, these four steps, the least automated it's going to become. So we think about having a birthday. You want to make a birthday cake, right? So the very simplest thing is having some commodities like eggs and milk and flour. And those are cheap. There's usually no price differentiation between those things. Very simple, and you can buy them usually in large quantities, right? So if you want to make a birthday cake for your friend that has a birthday, you buy some commodities. 
Then we have products that come out after that, and we're getting a little bit more expensive, a little more differentiated, differentiated, a little bit different. So now you go to the grocery store, instead of buying just eggs and milk and whatever, you buy a super double chocolate brownie fudge mix or something that's <laughs> that sounds super delicious, right? It's, but it's, it's customized. It has, oh, I like chocolate a lot. I want that double chocolate thing, right? So it's more customized and it's a little more expensive. Right? So you need to market that as well. The marketing jobs will go along with that as well. Next step up, if we go to services, right? So if you're like me, <laughs> you can't cook. <laughs> Even if you had a, a nice mix to cook with, you'll go to a bakery that's now usually connected to a lot of grocery stores, and you'll say, I need a birthday cake by this time. And they'll even customize it for the kind of flavors you want. They'll write something on it for you. They'll come pick it up in a couple of days. And so, again, we're getting more customized, right? It's harder to manage that. There's an extra interaction with a human there. It might need to be delivered. It needs to be picked up at a certain time. All these add complications to the automation of the process. So if you think about a farm making these products, it's very, autom it's very automatic, the price is set, it doesn't go up and down, you can't market, it's hard to market one egg over another in price, they're commoditized. Then the mix can be slightly more marketed, niche to niche people, it could be a premium product, it could be a less premium product, it could be more convenient and have, be a healthy version or whatever. There's a lot of things you can do to kind of find a niche market for that. That's whole, whole, a lot of big part of this um, helping yourself against automation is being able to find niches because big companies are going to look first for that big swath of customers that are doing the same thing and try to automate to them because then they see returns on their investment because there's a lot of potential customers. They won't want to automate or spend the time and the resources to automate a process that will only go for that, for example, the people that want the super double fudge chocolate people, thing, right? Those are a very s small subset of people. So the last bit is the experience. And this is what is going to, these jobs, especially when we talk about tourism where I work in the tourism department, Kyoto is giving someone an experience, They're creating an experience for someone, right? So instead of making a cake, you'll go to someone and say, Will you throw a birthday party for me? And they'll take care of everything for you, right? They'll, they'll find, you'll tell them what you like, what your interests are, maybe you like the Pokemon Go, and so someone will um, make a Pokemon Go theme adventure birthday for you. It'll be this great experience and everyone will come and you'll hunt Pokemon together and be happy, right? Something like that. So that's again, that's even more customized to the potential customers. It's more niche, but it's creating that experience that's gonna be hard to automate because it's gonna be customized to every person in this room. That's where we're going with the, basically the gig workforce, right? So to, to build that back, put that back to the first wave of algorithms, right? If you are a freelancer and you can, for example, translate from English into Japanese, there's an algorithm that's going to look and see there's, there's so many people doing that work and then it's going to be easier to commoditize or someone's going to try and automate that process. And so forth, it's going to be a little bit harder to find work for that skill set. But if you can create an experience around translation, let's say I translate and make it, I don't know, Pokemon style, if that's a style of special niche, right? So let's just say that someone wants a Pokemon slant to their translation. So they need somebody with some Pokemon knowledge, they need somebody with some translation knowledge. English, Japanese knowledge, what have you. So then you have this experience that comes along with the commoditization. So if you can figure out what experience might be niche for someone and create it, you're more likely to get higher paying jobs because the more customized stuff pays more and be able to find more work and come to the top of algorithms 
for people that might want to get something unique. Right? And because you're doing something new and unique, it may not be automated quite yet. Right? So those are the three things. Gate workforce, experience economy, and communication technology. All those things and those three steps are the driving forces in this automation world. How are we doing on time, guys? About five more minutes. Great. Yeah. Yeah? Five minutes, okay. Um, let me tell you about some of the things that our students are doing to try and get yourself into and trying to experiment with this experience economy, trying to create experiences. We're trying to use the virtual and augmented realities to create experiences for tourism, for travel, for leisure, and what have you. So, um, we have a VR tours. If you want to take a VR tour, I think Josh might be able to help you with that. <laughs> so, we talk about travel. Travel is a good example of the experience economy because most people want from a travel is the experience of being somewhere, right? But what if you can preview that before you go? Is it, could it be possible to automate the process of travel so you can put on a headset, go visit somewhere, um, go be in a room, a virtual room somewhere, and have the experience of being on the beach with your friend and not even have to travel? Could that automate the process? And so at our university, we're um, having students create virtual tours and try to make them unique with personal stories, with um, maybe some unique information. Because Google is doing this already, right? With Street View. Anybody use Street View? Right? Everybody uses Street View. Street View is very helpful if you want to go and see what it looks like at that particular location. So you're already becoming a virtual travel traveler in that sense. To go back to the algorithm, Google, every time you go into Street View and you look at a building, they're like, oh, that building might be popular. So they, Google will send an algorithm in to kind of analyze that picture a little bit more and have it read the writing on the billboard or what store that is, or maybe go on the net and try and find some pictures of the menu and prices and whatnot. So we're having students create these kind of personal stories and then they're getting experience giving tours, right? So you're not just walking down in street view, you're with a group of people and they're guiding you and trying to create some sort of unique experience with you on that tour. So if you've ever been on a tour, one of the most important things is the tour guide, right? Maybe they're interesting, maybe they're not, maybe you connect with them, maybe you don't. So that experience that they give you is probably the more important thing when it comes down to these things. So we're talking about trying to customize virtual tours uh, using VR. We made our own Pokemon Go. So think about an uh, open campus when you came to open campus for this university, right? Maybe you got a tour. Virt virtual reality tours are for when you can't go or before you go to somewhere. You can kind of get the sense of what it looks like, like the street view, but augmented reality brings the Pokemon to where you are. So for a tour that you're physically there, something like a Pokemon is a good example of giving you an extra experience to a tour when you're going with a bunch of people. So using uh, an application, you first show up to show up to go to that campus, you get an app with your phone, and then a video pops up. There's students made these different types of games. One is a uh, crime story. One student says, I'm the chief of police. you got to help me. Uh, someone has stolen some very important information from our library. We need your help to find it. And you get a hint. And you think about that, you're with a group of people, and you go walk around campus, and you find another location. And then, using augmented reality, the chief of police pops up, like, oh, you found him, but you just missed the, the robber. I think he went here. I think I, he likes something, something. And so you get that information, you go on to the next step, the next step, the next step. So then you have the experience of getting to know the students and their creativity and getting immersed in this kind of like story. But then at the same time, you're learning what's on campus. You're getting that tour. So 
So this is harder to automate that process, right? So you can think in the AI world with robots, you can show up to campus and you can just send a drone, a flying drone out, and it'll say, uh, well, what are you interested in? And then it'll take you, if you follow the drone and walk to the library or walk to it. That could be automated probably quite easy. But something like this, where you can put it to some sort of narrative, some game world, some kind of gamified situation, that's a little bit harder to automate. So we're, we're thinking about that process when we're making this. And uh, we have these walls around campus. And people, students are experimenting with putting digital contents into a physical space. So there's a wall on campus. You can go and talk about an experience you had in that area. And then other people can come up to that wall and see videos of things that happened maybe previous tours, previous uh, visitors to that area. It's connected now to that one. Right, but this is my, probably my last slide here. I think I'm starting to run out of time, but these are some of the um, videos from some of those things that students have created. So for example, this one is um, using the cards to talk about some of the presentations that have happened on campus. This is a wall that students go and they can trade information, uh, virtual video testimonials. And this is um, a tour that we did for the city of Fukushima at City Hall, where you get thrown into an adventure and you learn the history and the laws about Fukushima by going on this little adventure. And here's a book that's augmented with videos that students make. So they're connecting these digital contents to physical items. Yes, one last thing though. So the World Economic Forum thinks about this. So if you want a resource that's really doing a lot of research into the future of automation and what kind of skills are going to be required, the World Economic Forum puts out a report every two years about the most highly sought skills when thinking about automation and moving into the future. So the, these are the skills that are in decline. These are the skills that are in growing. So analytical thinking and innovation, make, making something new, because computers can't do that yet. We can't make abstractions. Right? And a little bit, number one, declining, manual dexterity, endurance, and precision. So if you have a job that you have to be super precise and do the same thing again and again and again, that's likely to be automated because you can do it cheaper, faster, and probably better than humans. Um, memory, like I said before, we're already putting lots of our brain into our mobile device. It's going to start happening more and more in the future. Uh, another skill is cognitive flexibility. Cognitive flexibility. That means to be able to forget what you've learned and learn something new about it. So have the ability to take your previous experience, previous knowledge, and temporarily put it aside so you can learn from a different angle, from a different lens, a different way of doing it. Because computers are, are going to be a little bit better about taking in new information, presenting it to you, but so you're going to have to be able to adapt with it. That's me, I'm Eric. Please be my friend. If you're interested and you have questions, you can uh, look me up online any of these <laughs> these things all right thanks very much for listening to me today Things like that. 
but there seems to be, for the short run, more jobs being destroyed than created. So this is a really difficult question because there's no easy answer, right? A lot of, especially repentant work. You think just about Uber, about Uber, and that is starting, to, like that has pretty much destroyed a lot of taxi companies in a lot of cities, right? The, the someone that got job uh, got paid to sit in a taxi and wait, and, uh, and they have insurance, and then Uber, which people do it quicker, it's easier, it's more convenient. In a way, that they, they're disrupted for a reason because the taxi companies weren't doing a good job of, you know, increasing and making their service better. But what's going to happen to them? In the next stage, where uh, robots start doing more, we're going to get automated cars. Right? I already I said that we're training our machines right now. If you have a Tesla or if you have a car that has a semi-automatic driving system, that car, you are training that car how to drive. So if you're driving your Tesla around town, it's so soaking up all that data. So one day, sometime in the future, when socially it's acceptable, or when we have the laws in place, that car can now drive itself. So think about, the, in the United States alone, trucking, trucking, people that drive for a living, people that drive large trucks, large semis, transporting goods back and forth, that is repetitive. We're usually driving the same routes. And so right now, there's cameras on a truck, some truck driver, poor truck drivers training an algorithm that's eventually going to put that person out of the job. What does that truck driver do when his job has been replaced? Right? This is not an easy question to answer. There's a lot of initiatives, especially in the United States. Truck driving is the number one job in, I think, 13 of the 50 states in America. Something like 3 million truck drivers in America. That's a lot of jobs. So if you want to talk about uh, training them, Retraining them. There's a lot of talk about you know giving them free school, maybe learn teaching them how to code, but those jobs it might be automated, <laughs> but just ahead of them, right? So this is a very difficult question, um, and unfortunately, it's going to be your generation that's going to have to face a lot of these issues, because um, right when this is hitting at the hardest level, it's probably about when I'm retired, about 20, 30 years from now. And it, this is, it's hard to say what jobs will be taken first. Like even things like public school, I mean, you might start learning online. You might have a hologram come to your house and teach. Um, that's why I think this is, this is why I wanted to talk to you about this, because you want to start thinking about getting into that more experience style jobs, getting into those more niche style areas of work, so it's less, it's harder for your jobs to get automated in a way. There's, once, idea. Um, we don't tax automation very well, as far as the society goes. So we need to maybe figure out a way to tax every robot truck mile. If, that, if that's one possible solution, I mean, we're going to have to think about things like this, right? Because if we're going to put three million truck drivers out of work, all of that what, what used to happen to a profit for those truck drivers are going to one company. Right? And how do we, ta how do we, that all that gets, that power, that economic power gets centralized into one company, one or two companies. How do we deal with that? And how kind of societal structures we put in place? We're going to have to need something like that, probably, in my opinion, in the future. That's probably something your generation is going to have to debate. Sorry, was that a long answer? <laughs> but I have, to, I have to make this faster, won't I? Sam's in sound. Okay, let's get another one. Misaki, do you want to do another one? Misaki, Misaki, you want to right here, please. Thank you for your presentation. You. We have one question about the art. So when I wear a VR glasses and someone else like with VR glasses too, 
and it is possible to see the like other person with VR, like drawing VR. Do you understand what I mean? I think so. Is that possible to see that? Uh, okay, so let me try and uh, repeat the question to make sure I understand it. Okay. I'm wearing a VR headset, a headset, so now my vision is blocked. I have a screen on my face now, and now someone else has a VR headset on, they're being blocked. Can you see them? Can you see them? Even though they're standing, let's say we both have VR glasses. Yeah. Can I see you? In the blue, oh. Like, yes, well, that's, that's the answer. Yeah. So in the VR world, if you're doing the mixed reality, right? Um, for example, we're starting to put digital realities on top of the real world. Pokemon Go is an example of that. A digital Pokemon is in our real world. So the answer is maybe. If that technology, if you're in the same virtual space as the person standing in front of you, you'll see them. But you'll only see them in the virtual world. But it's possible that you're standing right next to a person and you're in America and they're in Japan. And you, you're so far away, even though you're standing right next to each other, right? So, yes and no, I guess is the answer. I don't? Okay. Yeah, you can make so far. Okay, a middle person, middle person. Maybe somebody hasn't asked the question before. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. My major is nursing, and I'm interested in medical engineering. I hope AI technology make use of medical treatment. A treatment, and I want to ask what and your opinion. Okay. So the question is um, using AI and other immersive technologies like VR and AR. What does that mean for the, the medical industry, or or the future of medicine? Well, if if we keep on topic with automation, um, a lot of processes for our health are already being automated. Um, we can now have Fitbit trackers, so things like regular checkups about our blood pressure, we don't have to go to the hospital as much, and we have more data to share with our doctors and nurses about our ongoing health. I'm wearing one right now. There's a lot of privacy and data collection issues still that we need to solve about that. One job in particular that's interesting about automation is radiology. Radiology is the type of medicine where you take x-rays and you put them up on the wall and you find tumors. Those doctors spend years and years to learn how to read that picture and see little blobs in there and then figure out, oh, that's a tumor. We've already trained AI to do that so quickly and so much better than our best radiologists. So that job is Good job. It's like $60,000 US a year base, and now probably nobody's going to hire a radiologist now because the radiologist is going to do it a lot better. So that's good for patients. They get <laughs> the way we train AIs are going to be really interesting too. So, as like I said, humans, we're going to be training AIs to find these tumors in the pictures. But if it gets trained by we're trained, humans are training them, so humans obviously have biases, we have weaknesses, we're not perfect. And AI has a tendency to amplify those things. Right? They have a tendency to amplify our feelings on social media too, like an algorithm. When we're angry, we post something, we make somebody else angry and things get amplified. Same thing happens with medicine. One doctor training an AI system makes a mistake or has a bias. They're looking at, to train the system, let's say they're looking at x-rays of Americans, but then an African-American or a Japanese person comes in, that AI is trained to look at specific types of bodies, and now you're biased, the AI is biased against you, possibly. So we have to start thinking about those technological, these ethical issues related to medicine and those things. Great question. Okay, maybe somebody from the left side this time. Chris is coming for you. in an interview for a job um, that the interviewers could look up uh, what he put on online or S in SMS. And is that from the algorithm? And also, does that invade your privacy and stuff? All right, great, great question. So, talking about the future of work and getting through, first of all, there's two parts to that. 
So first is, before you get the interview, an algorithm is taking a thousand applications and turning it down into 10, 15, whatever that job holder wants, right? They, now there's more people applying for less jobs, so they need an algorithm to say, I, want, I only want to interview employ, uh, people that have had this experience or have seen this thing or, or this age, or right? And that gets put through the algorithm. So an algorithm right away has decided whether you get an interview or not. And you have to be able to know, it's, sometimes it's a black box of well, how that process happens. But there's another part to that question is, um, how you feed the algorithm. So all of us have a digital footprint. Everything you do online, everything you look at, and this augmented virtual reality stuff is going to get even worse, right? There's more data going to be collected about us because something like Pokemon Go collects your whereabouts, what you're looking at, how much time you spend on it. Social media is just the pictures you upload, right? It's a little less invasive. But that digital footprint is there forever. And companies are going to be able to access that information. So be careful of what you put online because it can show up in an algorithm into the future, most definitely. And without your knowledge, your things you put on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, companies are already paying for that information to sell you things. They're already gathering information about what you do, what you click on, so they can target you with ads. Com higher companies are going to be starting to do that more and more. Just figure out who's hired. So if you go out drinking, <laughs> put your phone away and don't, you know, don't do don't do silly things on the internet. Basically, we all, I mean, I teach a digital literacy class at Kilting University, and what we talk about a lot of the times is um, our digital self. We have a we have a personality that we have in the real world, but we also have a personality that we project of ourselves online. And we want to try and make that the best possible because those are the things that are going to be fed into algorithms more. We only put our best selfies on Instagram, right? Not when we wake up in the morning. That's not our real self. Right? <laughs> Great. Does that answer your question? Great, thank you. Okay, maybe we have time for one or two more Misaki side questions. Go for Misaki. Look her in the eyes. Get her to come to you. Of the VR and VR headsets for it's the virtual reality world. <laughs> about the influence of using VR and VR headsets for users, eyes, and heads. What do I think about using VR headsets, about using users' eyes and heads? Yes. Hands. Health. Health? Health. Oh, okay, so maybe you're asking about the possible bad health effects of using VR. Maybe you're asking about maybe some harms that might come to us if we use AI. So, I'm old, this will tell me how old I am. I, my mom used to say, don't sit so close to the TV, you're gonna ruin your eyes. But now we're putting phones three inches from our eyes, all right? So that all went out the window. We still are trying to figure out a lot about VR. So our research group, for example, are trying to find more research about it. There's not a lot available right now. For example, um, young children. I'm really concerned about this use for young children because um, you're, you're moving your, you're still learning how to move your body and articulate your, your limbs and things like that, and you're growing at the same time. So you're still training your brain to function physically. If you spend too much time in virtual worlds, it, it may have a different set of physical laws. Like a different set of gravity, or when you move your head, it moves just a little bit faster, or it doesn't track your legs, and you don't get to see your legs. So that will have a definite, have some influence on your development as you get older. What they might be, or how severe, we just quite don't know yet. 
Does that answer? Yeah, one more minute. Anybody have a question? These guys over here were very Yankee. Okay, one more time, let's say thank you to Eric for his very thoughtful answers. Good questions, everybody.